Welcome to the third afternoon of the future. And uh, it's a big, big honor, and we are more than pleased that Professor Ernst Uli von Weizsäcker is for the third time with us in Fort Wangen for an afternoon about the future. And um, yeah, we have, we know the song from Erich uh, Grönemeyer, and uh, we are all friendly, of course. But to the planet, the behavior is often not so friendly. And we are on the move, like Fridays for Future, innovation, uh, the whole world. It's an international challenge. And today, the topic of Professor von Weizsäcker is sustainable development requires lots of feedback loops. And this complements our first two afternoons of the future. In 2019, the topic was, in German, living space Earth, we need quality innovation for our future in order to be X times, for example, more resource efficient. Now, Fort Wang University, deriving from the Clockmaker School, a huge history, fundamental to the innovation region, it goes hand in hand. The wheels have to match, and the challenge for the future is hand in hand. That different perspectives, like a puzzle, fit together, and fit together timely and pretty fast. And last year, 2020, Professor von Weizsäcker um, continued with a, a new enlightenment is needed for our full world. Yeah, we are in a full world. The world is developing, luckily, the whole world. Asia, China, all the world, since the Iron Curtain came down, has changed, as we all know, tremendously. And Professor von Weizsäcker is one of the most renowned uh, persons in the world uh, for as an environmental scientist, but not only that. He can overlook the sustainability domain from a scientific, political, economic, philosophical, and um, societal, social uh, view. So his knowledge and his responsibilities, that um, his track record uh, during the last decades, it's a unique um, knowledge, unique expertise. Um, you have been the co-president, for example, of the Club, Club of Rome. So more than 50 years ago, I think 53 years ago, the Club of Rome at MIT in Boston, a couple of people already envisioned then our resources are limited. So limits of growth, of quantitative growth. Yeah? Not qualitative growth, but quantitative growth. And um, your book here, for the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome was titled, Come On. Yeah, why don't we start into a good future for all? In German, it's called Wir sind dran. So let's move, and if we don't move, then we are sind dran. Then we will take, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately as well, um, consequences. Hopefully, hopefully not. Um, you have been a member of the German Parliament, uh, then uh, the positions at the UN, the president of the uh, University of Kassel, the founding director, and for many years at the Wuppertal Institute, at University of California, Santa Barbara, the Brand School for Environmental Sciences, and welcome to Fort Wangen. So let me continue and talk a bit about feedbacks. Everybody, in a way, knows what a feedback is, but I'd rather prefer to briefly explain. In biological cybernetics, the feedback is the normal thing. And anyway, in um, systems, you always have positive and negative feedbacks. What is that? Well, essentially, you have an input and then some kind of an amplifier, and then it could go on, essentially enlargement. 
But for most biological functions, it is absolutely essential having some kind of automatic control reducing the impact. Because mostly, growth leads to explosion, leads to collapse. And this has to be avoided. And for that, you need negative impacts. Do we prefer negative or positive feedback, feedbacks? You know, negative feedbacks stabilize the system. That's these fat arrows showing you. While positive feedbacks tend to lead to a catastrophic collapse once the limit is reached. So that book mentioned by the Club of Rome of 1972, The Limits to Growth, is essentially an appeal towards negative feedbacks. Because otherwise, we would go on and on and on, and all of a sudden, the limits are there. Well, in American English, positive feedback makes you happy, negative feedback's sad. And this, that, that's a cartoon from, from America. You, you see this smiling face? It's positive, you know, it's positive. We have to be positive, you know. Um, in the US, you are obliged to be optimistic all the time. At least from the time of Ronald Reagan. That was the decade after the oil crisis where people were unhappy about the lack of growth. And he said, no, let's do it. Let's be positive with this pronunciation. And I was living in America from uh, 1981 till 84. It was the high time of Ronald Reagan. And I saw that. And I noticed, as a natural scientist, that this was complete nonsense. Yeah, it's crazy. It's self-destroying. But he would never have admitted that. A system without negative feedbacks is either dead or commits suicide. Every biologist knows that, but in economics, this system's law is ignored. In the US, they think innovation is much too old-fashioned. The real progress shown in the Silicon Valley is disruptive. Um, there was a publication in 1996 or so by two authors, Bauer and Christensen, about disruptive technologies in which they show that the economics philosophy of Joseph Schumpeter was correct. Meaning, creative destruction, which has become the fantastic invention of economists. You have to destroy the old things, and then you are great. This was Joseph Schumpeter. And these guys, uh, Bauer and Christensen, realized that they couldn't call their technology hype destructive technologies. Nobody would have accepted that. So they called it disruptive. The term disruptive was completely innocent at the time. But this is now the philosophy, not only of Silicon Valley, but of all people in America, with a few exceptions, of course. Um, the world population is at the center of non-sustainability. Our Club of Rome book, published in 1972, was written at the time when we had roughly three billion people on Earth. 
And we say it limits to growth. But what happened? More than a doubling. And we were proud of it, you know. Growth, growth, growth. That's the um, strategy of all governments of the world. I don't know any one e uh, counter example, you know? Which means we are determined to run into collapse. It's a horror, a horror story. The opposite of what Grönemeyer has been singing a moment ago. The current dynamics of world population lacks negative feedbacks, except in China, or in Germany for that matter, or in Japan and a few other countries, but it so happens that those countries that were able to stabilize their population are the big, big winners, not the losers. While the countries, chiefly in Africa, where you have five or eight uh, children per family, uh, are the big, big, big losers, you know? So, stabilization means winning, non-stabilization means losing. But people don't know that. Let's look at the env environment for a moment. I believe every other year, the United Nations Environment Program, now it's an organization, publish the Global Environmental Outlook. The last one that uh, appeared was in 2020. Uh, lovely front page, but the um, substance is devastating. I don't go into the, all these arrows, just at the bottom line about feedback. Uh, the f further you go to the right end, the more destruction is there. And on the left-hand side, it's stability. So, we see the world running into collapse in, uh, in this case, five different parameters. I don't go into details. But essentially, the GO6 report tells us the story of massive destruction in essentially all parameters. This is the Global Living Planet Index. It's steadily deteriorating. This is coral bleaching. Those are the, uh, essentially the Pacific Ocean but then also the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic. Uh, the brown things is the place where too much of certain chemicals was there, or warming or so. That's destructive. The state of the planet is broken. It is not sustainable at all, despite the wonderful 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted in, in, in 2015. Um, and Antonio Guterres, the um, UN Secretary General, says, other than with COVID-19, there is no vaccination available. You know? Vaccination is a good thing. It's stabilizing. But the kind of growth, growth, growth that we celebrate is without vaccine. Well, vaccination, by the way, is also a negative feedback. Luckily. Okay. These are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals unanimously adopted among all countries of the world or of those members to the United Nations. The question is whether it guarantees sustainability. My diagnosis is it's the opposite. No. Essentially because the goals 1 to 11 are essentially growth imperatives in a language that sounds wonderful, like 
no poverty any, anymore, no hunger anymore, um, no uh, mediocre uh, education, no um, disease, everything, everything gets great. It's wonderful. This is the core of the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. At the time when that was negotiated, I was co-chairing the International Resource Panel of the United Nations Environment Program, and in this capacity was invited into the uh, discussions at the East River in New York on the Sustainable Development Goals. And I saw the voices of the developing countries, countries unanimously saying, growth, growth, growth. That is what we, name, what we call sustainable, you know? And if that is happening, the goals 13, 14, and 15 will be dead. This is climate, oceans, and biodiversity. It's a formula compromise, you know. In reality, the United Nations 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development essentially is an agenda on growth development. But nobody is supposed to say so. It's, it's a crime almost, you know. This picture shows more or less how much the economies of the world are investing into those 17 sustainable development goals. Number one, evidently, is health, which means growth, and overcoming hunger. Okay. It's agriculture, etc., etc. So this is where the money flows in. And how about biodiversity? Zero. The term sustainable development, actually a translation from the German Nachhaltigkeit uh, in 1981, in the World Conservation Strategy, was essentially meant to do something on nature conservation. The green bars are positive for nature, and the red bars are human society. But the development over 40 years was a shifting step by step by step by step by step, by step into all social growth. This is what people want. And nature has no voice. That's the tragedy. So much for the praise of negative feedback. It's not exactly popular, you know, but it's essential to have. Let me now switch to positive climate policies, which do exist, actually. But the first picture is global heating, heating relentlessly increases as a result of growth. Everybody knows that. Hardly any feedback in the system. The youth action, the Fridays for Future, was absolutely necessary. It's one of the most encouraging feedbacks that we had during the past couple of years. In summer 19, uh, 2018, there were 28 big wildfires in Sweden. And the other co-president of the Club of Rome uh, at that time, Anders Wikman, uh, came from Sweden. So I had a telephone call with him every, once or twice a week. And he always began complaining, oh, it's another big wildfire. And 
the Swedish shocks triggered and boosted Greta Thunberg's huge resonance. When she, in the fall of 2018, sat, sat f uh, at the Reichstag um, for a school strike, every Swede know she is right due to those fires. I had the privilege of getting to know her. The first European Fridays for Future meeting in Lausanne, nearly f uh, 500 um, pupils came from all European countries, not only the EU, also uh, Belarus and Iceland and other, other places. And they asked me to give the uh, initial talk and they rose to, to their feet to applaud and then um, Greta Thunberg came to me and said, oh, this is wonderful. I really have to listen to what the scientists are saying. And we had a lovely chat for half an hour or so about what we have to do. And I also mentioned the term of feedbacks. Okay. We at the Club of Rome gave our warnings in 1972. This was mentioned. The first big uh, Club of Rome report was a huge bestseller in all um, notable languages of the world. Uh, it was sold by the millions. All in all, 30 million copies sold. But climate and biodiversity were not, uh, not, not issues at the time. It was essentially local pollution and things. Well, fortunately, this book has been already presented, uh, which Anders Wickman and I coordinated but we had 40 people cooperating with us. And uh, I have now to uh, differentiate in English language the three chapters of the book. The term come on in the English language has two totally different meanings. The first is, come on, don't try to cheat me. And the other is, come on. So. Part one, come on, don't tell us the current trends are sustainable. They are not. And part two is, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. That's over. And then part three, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. So it's, uh, you know, the term is um, with a glibbery meaning, you know. But the translation into German was actually quite clever. It was not my invention, it was the publisher said, how can we translate Kommand into, into German? And Wir sind dran is a fantastic way of uh, pre, uh, translating that. Uh, I say that in German, Wir sind dran means uh, Wir sind an der Reihe. But if we do bad, and in Vietnam. Okay. At the core of Kaman is the distinction between empty world and the full world. The empty world that was earlier times, including at the time of the enlightenment in Europe of um, uh, Francis Bacon, uh, Immanuel Kant, um, Descartes, uh, many others. At that time, the human economy was small compared with the earth. But now, in the full world, which is not sustainable, the human economy is essentially destroying the living earth. The full world is now called the Anthropocene. 65 years of explosive acceleration. The red pictures are essentially economic uh, success stories and the left upper uh, graph is the world population. 
the thin vertical line is the year 1950. So from 1950 on, there was this explosion. And the green pictures are the answer of nature. And here, it is the more dangerous, the more destructive, the higher you go. So in all these 12 uh, cases, economic growth means destruction. One measure of the Anthropocene is the body weights of land-living vertebrates. It can be calculated. And the result of the calculation is that two-thirds of the body weights of land-living vertebrates is our slaughter animals. You know? And nearly one-third, 30%, is the body weights of us all of nearly eight, 8 billion people, leaving 3% body weights for all the wild living animals, including all the elephants and foxes and whatever you have in our forests, you know? Meaning we are in the process of destroying wild animals. It seems we don't want them. This is the present face of the Anthropocene. The current trends in the full world are in no way sustainable. Now, back to climate. The real heating occurs in the ocean. That's the blue thing. And on land and atmosphere and ice heating, it's that small red bar. Meaning, that the real scare may soon be the rise of the seawater table. This is from an Italian school book, Atlante Geografica Moderno, which shows the coastlines of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, and the coastlines during the last hot age. And you see, it's a fairly dramatic difference. And if that heating up of the water substance is going on, we will reach a hot age quite soon. It could be as little as 200 years or so. And then most of Denmark, most of Bangladesh, most of Florida, most of Holland uh, and one third of Germany will be under water, you know? And we are running towards that and are proud of it. That's the reality. Grim. Some 1.3 billion people live right at the ocean coasts, most of them in Asia. The red dots are cities of over a million people, and some of them have 20 million, like Shanghai or ba Bangkok or so. So, imagine 200 million refugees. Some of you will remember the political crisis resulting from one million refugees in Europe. Of course, we were very happy with the Paris Climate Agreement. But how do countries respond to it? The first reaction worldwide, I don't know any exception of a country, is, yeah, well, okay, let's do something more on climate, but it's going to be very expensive. So we need a lot more growth. That's the automatic reaction in all countries of the world. Well, is that the right answer? I suggest it's not. It's a mad answer. In these eight little charts, you see from left to right the per capita contributions for the GDP, gross domestic product, and from bottom to top, the per capita carbon dioxide emissions. And you see, 
in all eight relevant economic sectors is a clear, undeniable, fixed correlation between GDP contribution and uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And of course, everybody wants more ca GDP, or nearly. In other words, we are reasonably good doctors for diagnosis. We have realized that global warming is a toxic disease. But we are totally mad doctors for recovery. We systematically suggest treatments that make the disease worse. Would you go to such doctors if you are ill? I hope not. Well, people seem to prefer reassuring lies over the inconvenient truth. I was working in California at the time when Al Gore was vice president of the USA, and uh, he wrote a fantastic book, An Inconvenient Truth, and made a film out of that. And uh, I was uh, watching the film, an excellent film. And then a cartoonist uh, made this picture of a cinema in which you have two films um, rivaling uh, against each other, an inconvenient truth, Al Gore, and a reassuring lie. Where two people go, they all go into a reassuring lie. I mean, it's a caricature. Nevertheless, this is part of today's reality in all world's uh, countries. While we are sitting here uh, comfortably, some 600 new coal power plants are under construction or planned. You know? At the time when we in Germany are haggling about the question whether 2038 or perhaps 2033 is the right thing of decommissioning uh, our coal plants. Well, morally and symbolically, it's very important, 38 or 33. But in terms of climate physics, it's completely irrelevant. irrelevant. In other words, an effective climate policy must include the developing countries. A climate policy that is only aggressively addressing the rich countries in terms of physics is not good enough to stop global warming. What can we do? The German Council for Global Environmental Change in German Wissenschaftlicher Beirat Globale Umweltveränderungen, EBGU, has proposed the so-called budget approach, which essentially consists of the following. All countries of the world receive an identical per capita permit of polluting the atmosphere. But the old industrialized countries, including Germany, that's the red color, have already gobbled up those permits. So there is no, not anything left. The dotted lines uh, are the result of taking the budget approach um, literally. In 2024, it's over. But then the budget approach says, you are permitted to trade with the developing countries. That's the green color. They have still a lot of permits over, left. So we can go there and ask for f some additional permits for our internal combustion engine cars and for our gas heating and for our leftover coal plant, coal power plants. What would that mean? In that case, 
the Indian economy minister would soon switch from promoting coal power to renewables and energy efficiency because it would liberate lots of additional permits which he can then sell to us Europeans. Today, he is the most aggressive instructor of new coal power plants in India. But telling him, please stop this nonsense, doesn't help at all. But if we promise, using the budget approach, that India will become richer by decommissioning their coal power plants, or at least uh, not building more, and making a lot of money out of selling permits, that would make a, a huge big difference. It's a hundred times more important than this difference between 2038 and 2033, you know? But oddly, in the German climate debate, it's all domestic policy, as if that few last uh, coal power plants are the, uh, the change for the world. No, that would be the change of the world. But so far, it has not found sufficient support in the political uh, debate, not even with the Greens. In Common, when we go deeper and say that our civilization is in a deep philosophical crisis, we find the same concerns in Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si, where he declares that the current economy of greed relentless competition and wild acceleration is destroying our earth, our common home. Fantastic um, uh, encyclical. Responding to the philosophical crisis, we suggest to engage in a new enlightenment, enlightenment 2.0 if you wish, and uh, that would have to ha have a high appreciation of negative feedbacks, which is not the case now in the Anglo-Saxon world. So we have to persuade them. But we would have countries like India or Tanzania or Costa Rica for that matter on our side because they would see, ah, that's the way of rescuing Kolkata and Mumbai, you know? from uh, rising uh, seawater. Actually, uh, as uh, Achim has said, uh, I have given a lecture on the New Enlightenment uh, last year, so I don't repeat all that. I just want to re remind you that we have to go that deep into the civilizational out outfit, which currently is as mad as the, the doctor using uh, a recipe making the disease worse, you know. Then, a few words about policy change. We need massive changes in agriculture. Today's agriculture is the biggest enemy of biodiversity. But of course, Nobody is supposed to say any negative word about agriculture in any country, you know. And organic farming and um, cows grazing, not too many of them, uh, on grass are wonderful in absorbing carbon dioxide. You know, when I was president of Kassel University, I was courageous enough to say that our agriculture faculty needed organic farming. At the time, there was none in all of Europe. It was all classical, mechanized agriculture with a lot of chemistry, and they were so proud of it. I said, oh no, that's the wrong avenue. And the students 
were my friends. I asked them, interviewing them, what, what is missing? And some of them said, organic farming. Said, okay, let's do it. And then I had a two hours discussion with the agriculture faculty. And after that, two hours of discussion with the students on my side, they had an almost unanimous decision, yes, we have that. And in the meantime, Witzenhausen, part of the Kassel University, is the European mecca for organic farming. Prince Charles from England came there and said, this is the place to go. It's a fantastic success story. Okay, agriculture. Energy, of course, everybody knows that. Uh, from coal to um, solar and wind, and actually, this is a very hopeful undertaking. At the time when my friend Hermann Scheer and I, as members of parliament of the Social Democratic Party, uh, pushed for the renewable energies law, the um, in feed in tariffs law, the cost of a kilowatt hour photovoltaics was roughly one euro. And all economists called us complete idiots that we were promoting the absolutely most expensive source of energy. In the meantime, mostly due to the mechanics of um, the economies of scale. A kilowatt hour of photovoltaics in Germany is five euro cents, and in Algeria or in Chile or in Australia or in Saudi Arabia for that matter is one euro cent. Meaning photovoltaic energy is beating nuclear, coal, oil, uh, actually also wind. So, that is the future of the energy story. And then transport, of course. Transport is a very dirty affair. Uh, I'm not going into more details. Then the circular economy, the organizing head of the European New Green New Deal, Franz Timmermans, the deputy of Ursula von der Leyen, um, he says roughly 55% of the homework for climate uh, protection is energy, and 45% is materials. He is also in charge of the circular economy. Because then you don't have to dig out billions of tons of minerals, which is also very um, energy intensive. Okay, then financial markets have to be recontrolled. I mean, what we are now reading about, uh, you know, cheating in the financial markets is the effect of deregulation coming up since the time of Ronald Reagan and um, Maggie Thatcher, since the early 1980s. And then after 1990, it got even worse. Everybody wanted to have deregulated financial markets, which essentially means that you cannot use the financial markets to do the right thing. They always do the wrong things in terms of ecology. And then the tax systems. Currently, over the last 10 years or so, we have figures about tax and other financial subsidies for burning fossil fuels in the amount of anything between 400 billion and 800 billion dollars a year. 
which is completely crazy. The same countries that signed the Paris Agreement do this nonsense. Isn't that crazy? So we have to revert the steering uh, function of the tax system. And then it's not only the shift from coal to solar, it's also energy efficiency. With a wonderful Australian team, I wrote a book called Factor 5, in which we demonstrate that a five-fold increase of resource efficiency is technically possible. For instance, my family and I are living in a so-called passive house, which essentially means we have no heating costs anymore. It's fantastic, great, uh, comfortable, etc. And the LED instead of the old incandescent lamps is also a wonderful uh, improvement. But most of those advantages or increased efficiency uh, technologies are not being used at all because all countries of the world try to make everything cheap. Cheap energy, cheap uh, raw materials, etc. So the opposite of what Franz Timmermann says about a circular economy. Okay, it's technically feasible. I think that's the end, and now let us debate about what you found very confusing. Thank you. Thank you.